applying God's Word to every aspect of life. This is Theology Applied. Hi, this is Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries. This is another episode of Theology Applied. Today, I am privileged to have as a guest um, a new friend of mine. His name is Jimmy Song, and he's recently written a book. I actually have it here, so I'll go ahead and hold it up. But he's co-authored a book with a, a group of his contemporaries. It's called Thank God for Bitcoin, The Creation, Corruption, and Redemption of Money. So tonight's episode is going to be interesting. We're going to be talking about Bitcoin, something that I'll just go ahead and uh, be honest up front. I know little to nothing about, um, but uh, just having lunch with him just a, a few weeks ago, uh, getting to know him and getting to hear his case for the morality of Bitcoin as a currency and the immorality and corruption of our current uh, nation's currency was just incredibly interesting. So I, I think tonight you could you could maybe call the episode this a theology of Bitcoin um, and broader probably a theology of money. So without further ado, our guest Jimmy Song, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your YouTube channel, podcast, or consulting, books that you've authored, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I, I'm a programmer and I've been one since I graduated college, which was uh, 23 years ago. So I've been a programmer for most of my life, actually. I started when I was like nine, like programming on little computers and stuff like that. But that's that's been my vocation for quite a while. Um, I got into Bitcoin in 2011 and, uh, and you know, I, I've been working at, I, I had been working at a bunch of startups um, all, all along then. And uh, 2013, I started contributing to open source projects that are related to Bitcoin for your audience that doesn't know what an open source project is. It's sort of like a lot of free software that exists. Uh, you know, developers sort of contribute to those. Linux is a popular one. A lot of free tools out there are open source. Um, you know, Bitcoin is one of those open source projects. So um, I'm, I'm one of those programmers that's in the open source community. Um, I, I started getting into it. I, I worked for a bunch of different uh, Bitcoin companies. I went off on my own in 2017. I started a little seminar for programmers uh, to teach them uh, the Bitcoin protocol and all, all of the programming things that are involved in that. Um, I started speaking at com a lot of different Bitcoin conferences all over the world. I think uh, 2018, I hit five of the uh, seven continents. I missed Africa and Antarctica, like traveling and, mm. and doing that. Uh, I have a uh, Twitter, uh, Jimmy Song, that's uh, uh, got 200,000 followers. I have a YouTube channel, Off Chain with Jimmy Song, that's got 28,000 uh, subscribers. Um, I, I uh, publish articles on Medium. I publish uh, a newsletter every week, um, jimmysong.substack.com. I have a podcast, Bitcoin Fixes This, which is which comes out once a week, although I have like a special episode that I'm debuting later tonight. So, um, you know, cool. lot, lots of different things and lots of different stuff. But yeah, I, I, I'm a Christian. I have been for all my life. Um, pretty much, uh, you know, like it, it was kind of a surprise to me that I got to bring that together in this book that I wrote with uh, some other yeah. Christian Bitcoiners. Thank God for Bitcoin. And it really started kind of as a, a as like a Bible study slash book study. Uh, and it, it evolved from there. I, I've written two other books, uh, Programming Bitcoin by O'Reilly. Uh, O'Reilly is sort of like the premier tech, pu tech book publisher, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And, uh, and uh, the Little Bitcoin book, which was a book I had the privilege of writing with seven other co-authors um, uh, about like what Bitcoin is. Is, uh, for sort of like um, a lay audience. So that that's mm. just a portion of what I do. I, I, I forget that's sometimes cool. like all the different things I'm doing, but that, but that's, uh, you know, pretty much everything that I do is has some form of Bitcoin involved. And hopefully I can help your audience understand uh, the theology of money and the theology of Bitcoin. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, all right. Well, let's go ahead and just dive right in. Uh, well, real quick, uh, you kept saying programming Bitcoin. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that the same thing? Again, complete, mm -hmm. you know, complete novice here. But is that the same as like mining for, for Bitcoin? What What is programming for Bitcoin? 
Uh, well, programming Bitcoin is uh, um, so it, 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 uh, ultimately it's all software and uh, and mm -hmm. programming sort of software on top of Bitcoin, for example, like programming a wallet. Uh, a wallet is basically something to keep your Bitcoin safe. Uh, that, right. That's that's essentially what a wallet is. Uh, you need programmers to create that software that can keep your Bitcoin safe. Um, there, there's also the Bitcoin core software. This, this is what you call a node on the Bitcoin network. Um, and okay. th this is what checks all of the uh, all of the Bitcoin transactions and the Bitcoin blockchain, if you've ever heard of that word out. We'll, we'll get to it, I promise, uh, like okay. exactly what that is, uh, including Bitcoin mining and all that. But I, I teach them all about the Bitcoin protocol and all of the uh -huh. elements that go into it, how it's designed. And, uh, you know, uh, it requires actually quite a bit of math. Uh, so, you know, there, there's something called public key cryptography. That's a critical part of it. Um, so there, that's, that's what I teach. And I, <laughs> yeah. That uh, word, and, what was that word again? Crypto say it again. Public key cryptography. So it's a, okay. it's a major yeah, way in which the entire internet works, right? Like you need okay. something like that in order to make sure that things are secure. And, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I do teach a, a lot of that and there, there's, uh, you know, I, I, I taught uh, a class for a semester in, uh, at the University of Texas, uh, like just teaching a bunch of graduate students this exact material. So it's it's cool. a lot of fun for me uh, being able to do that, because at one point I wanted to be a math professor, but instead mm -hmm. I start I, I did a startup. So I, I got to kind of do a little bit of that. And God's brought me to a place where I could I could, I could try all of these things that I thought I, I, I would never get to do. So, right. Great. That's awesome. Great. Okay. So just as, as nuts and bolts as kind of a uh, simple as possible. Could you explain the concept of Bitcoin to someone like me who has no understanding of Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin? Yeah. What is Bitcoin? Great question. And it is something that a lot of people butcher. Usually they'll say something like it's a money for nerds. It's internet money. It's, you know, it, it's just this digital form of money or something like that. And the way I, I like to describe Bitcoin is this decentralized, digitally, digital and scarce money. Um, and all of those words mean something. All right. So what is decentralized? Decentralized money is something like gold, something that you don't need any permission from anyone to go and try to get. So uh, a lot mm. of people are into gold mining, right? Or there are a lot of big gold mining companies anyway. They go and mine for gold. They dig for gold um, in various places. We usually call them gold mines. But they they are, uh, you know, in the business of uh, mining gold out from the ground. That is decentralized because you don't need anyone's permission to do it. There's no central gold authority that gives you permission to go mine for gold or not. Um, right. there, uh, that's decentralized uh, ver versus centralized. Something centralized is something like the US dollar or something like that, right. uh, which the Fed prints. And if you try to print your own money, um, they will arrest you, right? The Secret Service will come mm -hmm. and ar arrest you because only the central, uh, central Bank of the United States and the Treasury are allowed to like print the bills or uh, expand the money supply or whatever. Um, but this is true of a lot of other things, right? Uh, like American airline miles. If you have fake American airline miles, that's fraud. And, you know, it's only the American Airlines Corporation that can issue points for uh, the miles for American Airlines. Similar with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, World of Warcraft or something like that. They issue all of the gold in the World of Warcraft game. And if you, uh, you know, somehow hack at it and, uh, come up with your own way to come uh, create new uh, World of Warcraft gold in the game. They they would like cut you off from the game and like not let you do it. There's a central producer, right? And that's the big difference between centralized and decentralized. Is that centralized? Mm -hmm. You have somebody in control that uh, that that right. gets in the middle of all of these transactions, and that's uh, essentially the dollar system today. Now, what does and that's it where mean a lot of room for corruption can sneak in. That all of a sudden you can and, start expanding currency when there's actually not any more resources. The nation could actually be in economic downturn turmoil and you start printing more money and it's this it's this fake illusion that that you're 
you know, it's inflation and all those kinds of things. So, yeah, I mean, not only that, I, the, the main thing that having some party in the middle that's always in the middle of the transaction does is it, it creates what we call a moral hazard, right? They, they, they can print for themselves or, uh, you know, confiscate or do, do all, all sorts of nefarious things. And, you know, we'll, we'll definitely get to it, but uh, basically it, it creates a whole set of really bad incentives. Uh, but uh, digital is all about, you know, whether it's online or physical. And uh, gold is obviously very physical. And this is one of, of the properties that make it kind of a weak currency. And this is what led to fiat money in the first place, is that uh, it, it's very inconvenient to transport or store or anything because it's physical. You, you, it, it actually has a place and location. And that means that if you don't secure it properly, people will just come and take it. And th this is, mm. you know, uh, like the story in the Bible of, uh, uh, of the man who was, uh, tra the, uh, the Samaritan that, you know, uh, helped the guy out that was robbed. Well, right. Why was he right. robbed in the first place? It's because he, had you know these bare instruments like gold or whatever um people don't do that for your you know checks from your checking account because they they can't right. sign it and the bank will figure it out and that sort of thing so um you know the physical nature uh, of gold is one thing but the digital nature of the dollar is actually why um you know uh, the justification anyway for a lot of central mm. banks to make them digital because it, it is mm. enormously convenient especially for trade over distance uh so uh in the old days they used to have like these wildcat banks in the in the west and so on and they they would have like bills of exchange or whatever um the these were uh these could be redeemed for gold but they they carried those so that it uh, you didn't have to actually carry the gold with you if you carried the gold with you someone robs you then you lose the gold but if you uh, if you carry the bill of exchange with you and somebody robs you well they take the bill of exchange but then they they try to cash it with uh you know your signature they can arrest them and so on right. like so it was a lot safer to to do that sort of thing and uh you know that's sort of like a very rudimentary version of why you know sort of uh currencies became digital is that it, it uh, Ultimately, it's because it became much more convenient. And, uh, you know, mm. these days, uh, you know, almost all transactions are digital. If you're using your credit card, that's absolutely digital. Right. If you're, uh, you know, buying something online, that's obviously digital. Uh, almost uh, like cash is actually kind of not uh, frowned upon in a lot of places these days. Mm. And we'll, we, we can yeah. talk about why that is. But uh, Bitcoin is both decentralized and digital. And this is something that we never had before. Almost everything digital that was something like money or had money-like properties, uh, we talked about American Airlines miles, uh, World of Warcraft gold, even the US dollar, uh, they're, they're all centralized. Uh, the, the thing mm. about Bitcoin that's unique is that it's decentralized and digital. And in addition to that, it's also perfectly scarce. There will never, ever be more than 21 million Bitcoins. So, uh, to answer your question, what is Bitcoin? It is decentralized, digital, and scarce money. And all of those things are there for a particular uh, reason, which is to make it the the best form of money that uh, that we've ha we've ever had, uh, in a sense. Explain. And that, that's that. That that that's a great explanation. Real quick, explain. You said there will never be any more than twenty one million Bitcoin. What what does uh -huh. that mean? That means that, that? Uh, currently there's about 18 and a half million uh, Bitcoin. So um, okay. part of the design of Bitcoin was, okay, you need some way to get uh, Bitcoin into the hands of people, right? And this is sort of like the bootstrapping problem for any sort of currency. If it's, um, if it's something centralized like the US dollar or something like that, uh, or you know, uh, this happens in Latin American countries all the time, they revalue the currency and say, okay, you know what? Throw out your old notes, you can convert them to these new notes. Um, they, they have to get out the new currency, right? They'll, they'll usually name it something different. It goes from you know, the peso to like a real or something like that. Um, but that, that happens all the time. And, uh, and the way they do that is uh, they convert the old currency to a new currency or something. But when you're bootstrapping a brand new currency, you have to have some way to make it possible uh, for other, uh, other people to get it. So the way Bitcoin was designed, and it was designed by an anonymous pro uh, programmer called Satoshi Nakamoto. We have no idea who this person is. And it's sort of like the deep throat of our time. And a lot of people uh, sort of investigate this. I get calls from reporters still about, uh, about hey, do you think this person Satoshi or whatever? But anyway, 
the 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 whole idea is that you you have this currency and you need to um, put it into existence. So the way it works is that you can mine for Bitcoin, right? And I told you before that it is decentralized. It's decentralized in, in the same way that. Uh, that gold mining is decentralized. Uh, like anyone can go, I, I can go into my backyard and try to dig for gold. Uh, I'm probably not going to be right. successful because I don't happen to be very good at it, but it's decentralized in the same way. Um, anyone with a computer or a smartphone and, or anything can try to mine for gold, but you're probably not going to be successful because your, uh, your computer or your phone is not very good at it. Um, I mean, it can, mm. it's certainly better than doing it by hand. Like um, you can, literally try to mine by hand if you wanted to but uh it's mm. uh, some guy tried it i think it took him like a day and a half to do one uh a modern mining machine does a trillion in about one second so that that gives you an idea of like the order of magnitude uh a trillion what are you talking about gold or back to bitcoin back to bitcoin uh, so instead oh. of uh all right all right so let me describe mining real quick because that that's yeah, essentially yeah. what describe, we're talking about cuz cuz a second ago you said there's only there could only be 21 million and that's then you right. just said a trillion oh oh uh, yeah that that that's a trillion hashes per second so i'll i'll describe what that okay. is so uh, let, okay. let's uh, let's go finish the 21 million first yeah, so yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. the design of the protocol was that uh you know at, at the very beginning you get uh, there was 50 Bitcoin that would be mined every 10 minutes. Okay, so 50 every 10 minutes. So uh, for the first 210,000 blocks, and uh, that, that number is chosen because 210,000 times 10 minutes is 2 million, uh, 2.1 million minutes. And 2.1 million minutes is roughly four years. <clears throat> so every four years, um, uh, for the first four years, there were 50 mined every block. Um, so 210,000 times 50 is 10.5 million. So there were 10.5 million Bitcoins that were created in the first four years. The next mm. four years, it's 25. So it goes from 50 to 25. So um, every 10 minutes, it's 25 Bitcoin per 10 minutes. And it does that for 210,000 blocks. So 25 times 210,000 is 5.25 million. So 10 and a half million plus 5.25 million. Um, then the next four years was 12 and a half. So it, it, it halved again. So it went from 12, 20, uh, 50 to 25 to 12.5. Uh, and mm -hmm. 12 and a half times uh, 210,000 is 2.625 uh, uh, million uh, Bitcoin. So 10 and a half, 5.25. Uh, and, and so on. So currently we're in the era where each block gets 6.25 Bitcoin. And then, uh, you know, th this era will end in about three years. Um, and then after that, it'll be uh, 3.125 and then it'll it'll have again and so on. So asymptotically, if you add all of those up, um, it's kind of like adding one plus uh, one half plus one quarter plus one eighth or yep. whatever. And if you know any math, that ends up that, right. that sum is two. Uh, similarly, right. this sum is 21 million. And that's mm -hmm. it. Gotcha. That's, that's all there is. Uh, but notice that you can have fractions of Bitcoin. It goes all the way down to eight decimal places. Um, and, you know, you uh, so it's not uh, the smallest unit of Bitcoin is actually one Satoshi and 100 million Satoshi equals one Bitcoin, which is uh, 100 sort of million. Like yeah, 100 wow. million. So, so wow. it, it divides way more than the US dollar. So the US dollar divides down to the penny, which is, right. uh, you, know, you know, fairly small 100. amount, like yeah. it, it actually costs more than a penny to produce a penny. I'm sure you've heard that. Um, mm -hmm. with, with Bitcoin, it goes all the way down to a Satoshi, which currently is worth about like, one twentieth of a penny, so it, it's it's way less, uh, uh, way more divisibility than the uh, yeah. than the penny. Uh, but, How much is yeah. one Bitcoin worth right now? Do you know? It is currently worth fifty six thousand uh, so, wow. dollars. Uh, so yeah, uh, so and it's 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 been kind of going crazy over the past few months, and it does have a lot of volatility. Um, you know, uh, but you know, back when it started, it was worth absolutely nothing, and very few people were mining. Uh, nobody really knew about it. Uh, the few people that did, like, thought it was kind of like a fun project for, um, you know, anarcho capitalist cypherpunks or something like that. And then, uh, you know, 2010 came around, it started gaining momentum. And the thing that put Bitcoin on the map was 2010 WikiLeaks 
lost its PayPal account. Uh, so PayPal, uh, they used to have a donation, uh, you know, PayPal account, so people can donate to WikiLeaks, so they can, you know, expose more uh, things from the government and so on. Uh, but uh, PayPal got a tremendous amount of pressure from the Department of Justice, and uh, and they said, okay, we can't service this account anymore, and they just cut them off. Um, and at the time, uh, WikiLeaks was looking around for you know some way to still take donations. Um, and mm. then they found Bitcoin and, uh, and uh, essentially they started taking donations in Bitcoin. They, they started in 2011. Fun fact, they're still running off the donations from 2011 because Bitcoin's price has increased so much. So, wow. uh, you know, you know, obviously it was like way less than a dollar back then. So, and it's like mm -hmm. $56,000 now. So they, right. they've done really wow. well as a result, but it comes back to this sort of like financial censorship uh, that's inherent in a lot of this stuff. Uh, but uh, and, you know, we can definitely talk about that as Christians get more persecuted around the world uh, mm -hmm. and even in the United States, right, where we're being labeled like, uh, you know, domestic terrorists or something like that. Right. Um, there's a there's right. a very decent chance that our bank accounts might be taken away, much in the same way that PayPal uh, sort of cut off uh, WikiLeaks uh, account wow. against yeah. it. So, yeah. So, uh, OK, so decentralized. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very helpful. So decentralized. Mm -hmm digital and scarce How, mm -hmm. now help me theologically mm -hmm. what, what is it about a currency being decentralized and digital and scarce that makes mm -hmm. it more moral than our current uh -huh. form of currency today that makes it more righteous and in line with biblical principles why should christians care about bitcoin yeah, and that that's an excellent question, and we uh, we cover a lot of it obviously in this book. Thank right. God for yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah. But the, but the main thing is that when you put a third party or uh, some centralized controller over a currency, it it it, pro it produces all sorts of moral hazards. So a moral hazard mm -hmm. is the ability to benefit yourself at the expense of everybody else, and this is something that mm -hmm. happens with the current fiat monetary system all the time. Um, so uh, just as, as sort of like a thought experiment experiment and something to sort of uh, get, get your juices flowing in your brain. Um, think about the last, you know, say 50 years or so, where are the best and the brightest people in the world going to right now? Like these are the people, the, the uh, 21 year olds that just graduated from Harvard or Stanford or MIT, where are they going? What industry have they been going for the last 50 years? Well, tech. a lot of them have been going into tech, but a lot of them have been going into Politics. investment banking, right? Investment oh, banking yeah. is the is the is the place to be. Now, why are they going into there? Is it because they all have such a passion for investment banking that you know this is the the thing that they've wanted to do all their lives? Not really. It's because that industry happens to be very near what we would call the money printer, the, the people that can produce more money. And uh, all banks kind of have this ability to print more money. And it's not just the central bank, the Federal Reserve that, that gets to print money. It's everybody underneath them. In fact, every loan is really uh, new money being printed. And the thing about uh, printing money is that when you print, this, uh, print some amount of money, uh, you are diluting everyone else's savings. So in a way, every time you print money, you you are stealing from everybody else. You're stealing value from everyone, everyone else. And this is mm. this is the sort of like uh, the theology of it is that you know we're we're told not to steal, right? We're, God God yeah. uh, gives us property rights. This is a a right that gives uh, that God gave uh, to us and uh, encoded in the eighth commandment: "Thou shalt not steal." It's some mm -hmm. it, it belongs to them, or it is in their care um, that that God gave them. And uh, and this is the thing with with the current monetary system. Vast majority. Uh, of people like keep their wealth in in some form of uh, something liquid, right? Like something like money or right. stocks or whatever. Uh, the right. ability to dilute means that they can they they can kind of uh, the central money printer can kind of take that away, and this mm. produces all sorts of really ill incentives, including sort of the federal government we have now. So since 1913, when the Federal Reserve was created, um, you know, like deficits have exploded and everything else. I, I don't need to tell you about all of that. But a large reason for why all of that has happened is because uh, when you have a central bank, and uh, they're, they're euphemistically called the, the lender of last resort, 
um, governments can spend however much money they want. So it used to be like so, sort of under hard money or whatever, you would have a, a budget of $3 trillion. Well, now you can spend $3 trillion um, and that's it. If you wanted to spend any more, you would have to get into debt and you would have to find people right. that were willing to lend to you. And the, the, this was often very exorbitant because governments aren't very good at paying back debt. So, uh, you know, they would mm -hmm. charge like 8, 10, 12 percent and they'd be like, oh, well, we can't afford that because then next year's tax revenue, we won't have a budget for that and so on. Instead, uh, the system we have now is that if, if you if you have three trillion in tax revenue and uh, you can spend five trillion or six trillion or whatever whatever amount you want, the deficit uh, or the amount that needs to be made up just gets sold as treasury bonds. Now that that's a, roughly the equivalent, but whatever the market doesn't buy, the Federal Reserve buys. It, they it essentially print money mm -hmm. into existence so that the government can spend however much they want. And in fact, the, mm. uh, we have like a $27 trillion federal deficit. The M2 money supply, which is one measure of all of the dollars that exist, is only like 19 and a half trillion. So that tells you that a lot of that, the, the monetary expansion has been at the feet of government, they, that they've been expanding money continuously by always sort of like deficit spending. And they need to do that because they don't get enough tax revenue and they have all of these services that they need to continue to fund. So what does that do like from a moral perspective? It, first of all, it makes politics, uh, it makes all, absolutely everything political because um, the government can and will do almost anything. Uh, it, it used to be that you know we'd, we'd have personal responsibility, that you're responsible for yourself. Uh, and the government is really there to make sure that uh, you know fairness is observed, that uh, if somebody is committing fraud, that somebody can adjudicate, if there's external um, threats that we can defend against it and things like that. Instead, it's become this, uh, you know, like responsible for everything, because in a sense, what everyone is asking is, well, uh, if you, uh, you know, they can, they can print money whenever they want. So when people ask, well, then why aren't you taking care of me, right? Why why can't I get health care from you? Why can't I get, mm -hmm. uh, you know, housing from you? Why can't I, why why can't you do all of these things? Don't you have the moral imperative now to take care of me now that you can print whenever you want? If you're printing right. for the sake of doing X, Y, or Z. Well, why, why aren't you doing that for me? So it puts this enormous burden on essentially the central authority. And it, it gives them enormous amounts of power because they have this power to print money. And that means that they can fund any program they want, uh, you know, like go uh, start wars wherever they want, uh, you know, create all sorts of uh, boondoggle programs to employ whoever like they, they can do basically anything. And in a sense, they feel morally obligated to because they they have the power mm. of money printing. And, uh, yeah. and, and, and that whole, the whole system becomes sort of very, uh, very political. Uh, it's, it's no longer about whether or not, uh, you know, you should collect taxes and do, do whatever. It, it's, it's all about, I want you to do this versus I want you to do that. Right. I want mm. you to spend money on this war or I want you to spend money on my health care or I want you to spend like it, it becomes like sort of like a tug of war for the resource, which is mm -hmm. the federal money printer. Uh, before it used to not be like that. And governments used to be much, much smaller for a very good reason, because they did. They couldn't be. Um, it, instead, it, it's completely bloated. Uh, and essentially all of those people, all, all of the edifice. Uh, of all of these social programs and uh, pretty much all of the regulation and everything, they end up rent seeking. And this is, uh, this is something that uh, I think you can look up in Timothy. I, I think the Bible basically calls them busybodies, right? People that yeah. are just sort of like looking like they're doing something when they're actually not yeah. providing value. Um, and, mm -hmm. and the Bible condemns them for a very good reason. But we got an entire government. Uh, in fact, most companies have large portions of busybodies or rent seekers all yeah. over the place yeah. because you have the money printer that is able to fund all of them. And, uh, and mm. that in turn causes an economy to be filled with a bunch of zombie companies, right? Like uh, companies mm. that you're not sure what they actually do, but right. they, they're really good at getting federal subsidies. So they, mm -hmm. they continue to exist despite not really right. providing that much value to society. So um, right. you, you, you get all these weird incentives 
you get uh, you, it, and you know, you, you even get like, uh, you know, changes to sort of like how people behave a lot. Uh, people instead, uh, instead of like saving, they consume because debt is like just so readily available to them. You know, how many people do you know that get into like insane amounts of credit card debt because they right. can get things right now. And, and again, that's debt, right? That, that, that's created out of thin air. That's money printed mm -hmm. on behalf of the people that are spending with the credit card. And of course they have to sort of like be enslaved afterwards. And that, yeah. Um, it, it, it causes all sorts of evil in, in, in civilization and at, at the root of it is the monetary system and it is a corrupt cesspool of theft that, that has mm. uh, caused a lot of these ills that we see today. Mm. That's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let me, um, let me ask you this. You, you've mentioned a couple times now, and so I just want you to flesh it out a little bit more, but mm. you said when somebody offers a loan, you know, or you mentioned just briefly the credit cards scenario that, you know, that somebody can have that instant gratification, right? And I remember me and you were talking about this when we had lunch together, you know, mm -hmm. in olden days, you, you know, if you wanted something, you would have to take, maybe it takes seven years, like Jacob worked for mm -hmm. Rachel, you know, seven years and he got Leah and he worked seven more years, <laughs> got Rachel, but, but the work was up front. The reward mm -hmm. was after the work was done. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it's hard even teaching that principle to our children these days. Let's, let's do the work first. And then we reap you know, I mean, that that is that is biblical. There's sowing mm -hmm. and reaping, mm -hmm. right? There's mm -hmm. planting and harvest. That's just the way mm -hmm. God's, when we think of God as the creator, it's his world. That's the mm -hmm. way he set it up. He set things in motion to where you don't, you don't get to eat something um, and then, and then pay for it afterwards. And so mm -hmm. anyway, so that, that makes a lot of sense, but you mentioned like with credit card or, or loans, you mentioned mm -hmm. that being in relation to printing. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. so I always think that when somebody gives a loan, right, if I loaned money, I, you know, uh -huh. to a friend or, or to something like mm -hmm. that, I would actually be giving someone something that I actually have. But it seems like mm -hmm. you're implying that we have credit card companies or we have the, the federal government, you know, mm -hmm. or even in the housing market banks that are, mm -hmm. that are actually essentially printing, uh, they're, mm -hmm. they're not actually loaning a resource to someone else that they actually have, they're, they're printing this fake so could you explain that? Am I right? Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that 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 is something that a lot of people don't understand. So say you're getting a mortgage, right? Uh, a lot of people, that's their biggest purchase of their lives. Um, say yeah. the house is like um, you know $500,000 or something, mm -hmm. and you get a loan for $400,000. Where does that $400,000 come from? Usually, right. yeah, like, uh, currently, like a 30-year a mortgage uh, uh, you know, is at around 3%. So is there somebody on the other end, right? Uh, it, if it was like you said, is there somebody on the other end that's like, okay, you know what? I will lend this money for 30 years and get a 3% annual return. Um, and uh, I'm fine with that for, and has $400,000 to do but that. I is always there thought banks, on the other hand? see, mm -hmm. I always thought the bank had $300,000, like legitimate mm -hmm. resources was giving it to me, if that's the yeah. loan that I'm taking and was mm -hmm. content because I thought, you know, they, they had a lot of money, but real money mm -hmm. that they actually possessed and they were content to get mm -hmm. slow returns. But it sounds mm -hmm. like what you're about to say is no, the bank writes on a napkin or something like that. You know, we're yeah. giving you three, but they never had it in the first place. <laughs> no, no, right? they don't. Uh, that's right. Because there's no investor that would, th that would take a 3% return over 30 years, right? Like uh, that, that takes way too long. The term of the long loan is too long. And, uh, uh, and they, they, they wouldn't do it, right? Like uh, there, there are lots of investments that get way more than 3%. So for them, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense. So what is going on? How are they? How are they getting this money? Well, they print it into existence. They they create the loan on your behalf, um, in the, in the same way that they create loans for businesses. They uh, that in the same way that the central bank uh, creates uh, creates money for the benefit of the federal government. All of all every loan in this economy, in, in the central bank backed uh, fiat economy, uh, almost every loan is basically off of, uh, you know, created into existence. And, and this is the privilege that banks have. And not a lot of people understand this, but this is what's called fractional reserve banking. They might have $10 in deposits, but they loan out a hundred. And the way they mm. do that is they just put, put, put a hundred dollars in their account and here it is, 
right? Um, and, and in fact, that that 10% reserve requirement has been completely eliminated. So basically, they can print that every bank can print as much of it as they want. So if they get, mm. um, it used to be in the past that if you had like $300,000, uh, you know, in, in your in the vault or something like that, and there were five quali- uh, five different homeowners that wanted a loan, well, you, you would have to sort of negotiate with them because you only had that one, uh, you know, they, they all want $300,000. So you could only yeah. lend to one of them. This is called opportunity cost, right? You have to evaluate mm-hmm. which one which one is best because if you lent to the wrong one, then you might not uh, right. you know, get your make money as back. much money as, uh, as you might or, yeah, yeah or, or even get back your money. Uh, but instead, mm-hmm. what a bank does is if you meet a certain standard, then you lend to all of them. And they can mm-hmm. because... This is sort of federally regulated. And in fact, the mortgage itself is insured by somebody called Fannie and Freddie. So all, all of that is there, there's no risk to the bank at all. Right. They, and mm. they, they get to collect interest on it uh, on money that they created out of thin air. And and that's how money the that they didn't even work worked. to. Whereas yeah, you and me, nope. we would have to work really, really, really hard to store mm-hmm. up that money. And then lend it out, which means that we don't we can't do certain things because we're putting that money on pause, real money, mm-hmm. and we'd have to wait thirty years. And for mm-hmm. us to get rich that way, we'd have to be like vampires with like a thousand year long <laughs> lifespans and stuff like that. yeah. So it's exactly it's not fair. exactly yeah. Oh, it's it's, it's not completely fair. not fair. And 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 the thing is, like they the the bank benefits. And you, uh, the the loan loaner benefits, right? Because right. Uh, obviously they're getting this loan. The bank obviously benefits because they're getting to collect interest, and uh, and you know they created this money in, in, into existence. And this is and it the key to e- yeah. The, this is the key to economics. Who those two benefit, but what just happened? Who's the actual one hurting? What are the unseen effects? Well, the unseen yeah. effect is that everybody's dollar is diluted just a little bit by the amount that it mm. was expanded. And this is something mm. that a lot of a lot of people sort of overlook. It's like, well, I got a loan, I'm fine, right? Like the, you know, it helped right. me or it helped my neighbor. Like, what's the, what's the big deal, right? Like, uh, how uh, how can you condemn that? Well, you have to recognize that the U.S. dollar, everyone that has the U.S. dollar, is now diluted by that much. Um, yeah. and, and it's not and it's not just people in the United States. The biggest holders of U- uh, U.S. dollars are actually abroad. It's people in third mm. world countries, right? They, where their own currency right. is so bad that they use dollars uh, to right. transact in a lot of stuff, right? I, I have a friend from Nigeria, Timmy, who wrote the book, with, uh, wrote my second book with me, and we were talking about the dollar. And you know, someone was saying, you know, oh, they, uh, the Nigerians, they use the naira. You know, they don't care about the dollar. He's like, are you kidding me? The dollar was the most important currency in my entire life. I, I couldn't care less about the naira if I had the dollar because that mm-hmm. was the stable currency for me, right? Uh, mm-hmm. and, and you're 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 really diluting their savings. Wow. You're, you're, wow. Uh, and that that's the thing that a lot of people don't get. And so every loan um, that that comes into existence, and th- this is at every level. This is for companies, right? Like they they issue corporate bonds or whatever, and uh, the, you know a lot of banks and uh, commercial banks and stuff buy them up uh, out of using money created out of thin air in the same way. If it if it meets like some, a certain bond grade or whatever, you know they they'll just buy it, right? Like this this is how right. the whole system works. Um, the entire system is based on debt that comes from nothing. Uh, and it, it right. dilutes everybody else every time. So what happens, yeah, the right. incentives in the system then are everybody is up to their eyeballs in debt. And this is true at the consumer level, at the company level, at the government level. And this is very obvious because if you're keeping it in cash, well, you're constantly getting diluted. But if you're in debt, then you're okay because, in in right. a sense, it, as it expands, it'll get cheaper to pay off. And, you're right. And, and, and it, so it's having kind of so problem. actually working hard, storing up, because mm-hmm. I, I mean the proverbs mm-hmm. all throughout the scripture, mm-hmm. but especially the proverbs, talk about mm-hmm. you know how the the wisdom and and the diligence and the, the you know the, mm-hmm. just the ethics of working hard and preparing and storing up. But what you're saying is that with our current our current system of economics and the way that we do things in our current form of currency, uh, it actually pays um, to, instead of to store up, the person who stores up, it's actually mm-hmm. like moth and rust are, are in real time on a daily uh-huh. basis eating up part of his storehouse. But the person mm-hmm. who has debt, there's like mm-hmm. this like like anti-moth and rust that's actually chipping away at his debt, making his debt <laughs> smaller. So he's actually, yeah. so the guy in debt is actually 
So, so the word of God tells us not to be in debt because, because it doesn't benefit you. The, the, the person mm-hmm. who is in debt is a slave to the lender. But mm-hmm. you're saying that it, because our, our system has become so corrupt that in, in mm-hmm. some ways, yes, the person in debt is still a slave. Um, mm-hmm. but they actually should be more of a slave. And then the, the mm-hmm. and, and if they actually were more of a slave, if it actually was more of slavery, like the Bible says to be in debt, mm-hmm. we probably would have less people. So, so haphazardly willing to put themselves into debt. That's probably mm-hmm. why we have so many debtors because, because debt often doesn't really, it doesn't feel real. It doesn't actually feel the way that, that biblically it should. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people are in debt and in slavery and don't even know that they're in slavery, right? right. Uh, how many people do you know that still have like student loans that they're paying off, right? Right. You're, you're, th- right. This, and why is- would you at this point, if I had student mm-hmm. loans, like my wife and I, mm-hmm. we worked really, really hard to pay off mm-hmm. student loans in the first couple of mm-hmm. years of our marriage. And mm-hmm. at this point, it's like, if I had student loans, I, I want to be trying to pay it off with mm-hmm. with with the, the threat, you know, because <laughs> that's what it actually <laughs> is. But, the, you know, the promise of of Biden, you know, and and mm-hmm. and hey, we'll just we'll do fifty thousand dollars, and and not just ten thousand, but fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And when you think who has fifty thousand dollars worth of mm-hmm. of school loan debt, it's not mm-hmm. really those people who are impoverished. It's not really the mm-hmm. poorest of the poor. The people with fifty thousand dollars in school loans are typically, you know, people who are bigger bigger earners, people who <laughs> with better careers, the people who don't need their debt paid off. And and if that happens. You know, like, because because I think sometimes people who don't actually have an understanding of economics, I don't have much of an understanding about about Bitcoin, but I, I know a little bit about economics. I appreciate Thomas Sowell. I, I just mm-hmm. finished reading his basic ec- economics, and I certainly understand, by God's grace, His Word and 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 theology, and that theology should be applied to all of life. That's what we want to do on this podcast: is let's apply yeah. theology to money, let's apply it to Bitcoin, all these things. And so, if you understand economics and you understand theology. Then, then one of the things that you you should be able to understand is is like because what you're talking about is a civil theft. It's you know, mm-hmm. and and it's like we know that it's wrong to steal from our neighbor as citizens. Um, mm-hmm. But but then somehow we think that when governments do it, when that that it's mm-hmm. all of a sudden it's it's not immoral. And so all that being said, my my point is just to say that like if if school loans get paid off, um, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden what you're doing is you're you're incentivizing people to to get into debt. And those who worked really, really hard to pay off their debt, you're actually stealing from them. It is is stealing because all the money that my wife and I worked to pay off, um, if if school loans are just going to get paid off by someone else, then then it's like, well, we we were robbed. Well, well, $30, your, your savings is being diluted by the we amount. We should have that, kept that uh, money and I could have yeah. invested that into a house that's appreciating in value. And mm-hmm. You know, and but but we were taught Dave Ramsey. I think of it like mm-hmm. pay off your debt first, pay off your debt mm-hmm. first, and mm-hmm. uh, but it doesn't actually sound like it's working. It works in God's world, mm-hmm. and and this is God's world. But I think it's so it's so corrupt right it's, now. That it's it, been twisted, right? The fiat yeah. world has uh, has all of the wrong incentives, and you do get into debt, and you do get into slavery. But a lot of people don't even recognize that they're in slavery, that they're. Uh, you know, like slaves to their appetites, for example. I mean, how many right. people are overweight right now? Right. Um, right. And, you know, the, the, this whole system is it, it, like encourages consumption because yeah. you can you can have anything you want right now because we will print money for you so you can have it right now. Only thing is right. uh, you're going to be, you know, in debt for and enslaved to us for like the next 20 years. How many people right. do you know, like work jobs that they hate, right? Because it right. pays a lot of money. And why do they need that money? Because usually it's some sort of lifestyle, but usually it's some form of debt uh, of some kind that they already consumed. And th- right. this is the thing. If you if you keep getting into this mentality of consume now, pay it off later, it has an effect on your soul. And it, it, it changes the way you think about things. And, uh, and mm. unfortunately, this has also come into the church. Oh, mm. many of whom buy like these giant, beautiful buildings that right. they can't possibly afford, but they're quote unquote doing it in faith. When in reality, they're just getting into de- uh, getting into slavery to the bank. And right. uh, ultimately what that usually ends up in is, uh, you know, even if they're some somewhat successful, they end up uh, finding alternative means of revenue, including like renting out their church for preschools during the week or, you know, mm. like uh, having lots of weddings there so they can pay off their mortgage, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, 
having all sorts of and those that, right and those you know, things wouldn't better. necessarily be inherently wrong but but ultimately mm-hmm. the big idea that what i think what you're getting at is mm-hmm. what it ultimately leads to is compromise and yeah. in the sense that like all right like well we you know it's not just the pastor's salary but but we have this massive you know loan that we have to pay this massive mortgage and and then all of a sudden you know maybe attendance starts to dwindle or people don't like that the pastor is preaching faithfully and he's preaching with mm-hmm. courage and he's attacking things you know in in the cultural sphere that aren't in line and in, in submission mm-hmm. to the will of Christ and people are leaving and and it's just this constant temptation to for for the the ministry the theology the preaching um to mm-hmm. compromise to compromise to compromise yeah, I, I think we talked about this before, and I, I really like the way you put it. Um, you know, you can either, be, uh, you know, a lot of nice Christians have a hard time with the truth. And th- uh, and this is because, you know, when you're nice, you, you don't want to like contradict people or whatever. I yeah, think the yeah. actual real way we're supposed to be is not be so nice. But if you're right. a church and you're super nice, you get a lot of congregants. And th- this yep, is just the fact right. you get more more people that are tithing and so on. So like the truth gets compromised. And in a sense, you are a slave to the bank because, right. you know, the, the money that you have to pay off is ultimately at the root of all of these decisions that slowly mm-hmm. eroded you know, the, the doctrine of, uh, of what's supposed to be. And right. th- this is the sad reality of a lot of churches today. And, uh, and I, I've seen a lot of them like oh, get into right. way too much debt and like just compromise in ways. Um, I mean, like even just like thinking about what, what happened with Ravi Zacharias and how he was like leading yeah. this whole like double life and everything. Right. Um, I mean, the, the reason why he, w- he was like invited to everything and, and like w- was because he was just so nice, right? But why mm-hmm. did he want to expand that ministry so big? I mean, there, there, there's parts of, parts of, uh, you know, uh, uh, parts, parts of, uh, wanting to be famous or whatever, but there was all, mm. always this like sort of availability of debt and, and things like that to expand the ministry right. a little more. And it, it's like, okay, the size of the ministry, look at, look at how many people I'm reaching becomes more important than being faithful to God's word. Right. Like he was mm-hmm. like invited to a Mormon church, didn't say anything about how they were wrong or anything. And, you know, like, right. Yeah. There, there's so many ways kinda, in which you end up compromising yeah, right. for, for the, just, just for the money. Yeah. It's just slavery. So you can be, you can be yeah. a slave to the fear of man. Right. So you mm-hmm. want people's approval, you want fame, you want glory, but you absolutely that, you know, can be a slave monetarily that, you know, the, the, the debtor is slave to, the lender and all these things are going to have an effect. And th- this is why all Christians, but especially ministers of the gospel should keep themselves pure from mm-hmm. worldliness, that they shouldn't be enslaved to, you know, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life. And so by God's grace, when I was pastoring in San Diego, I've recently now moved to Texas, as you know, and uh, mm-hmm. planting a new church, Covenant Bible Church, um, the north side of Austin. But when I was in San Diego, and I learned how to grow a church, and I also have some uh, really great experience in how to shrink a church, you know, and, <laughs> but, but during my last couple of years of, of my church shrinking strategies, um, mm-hmm. you know, as I was I, you know, we preached first Timothy and I, you know, I, I would, we'd get to hard text and instead of breezing over it, I'd slow down. We, we did first Timothy chapter two, verse nine through 15, where it talks about how women will be saved through childbearing and how a woman yeah, should oh, good, beautiful uh, you verses, know, learn, yeah. you know, yes, you know, she should be submissive and she should be quiet mm-hmm. and these kinds of things that do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. So I slowed down, did four weeks on that. And I, I was just telling our, our guest on, um, on, uh, another episode of Theology Applied uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, that each of those four weeks, the, the church lost 10 people a week. Within one month, we lost close to 40 people. But my whole point is to say, part of the reason why I could afford to do that was because um, I had a, a modest salary with the church. I had already mm-hmm. learned how to live on little. My wife and I were free from debt. Um, mm-hmm. And the church didn't own any property, although we wanted to. We certainly, I mm-hmm. wanted the church to get to get a building. I wasn't thinking really about. I mean, the things you're mm-hmm. saying are really, really interesting, and it, it's mm-hmm. convicting. And I've got a lot. You're leaving me with a lot to think about. But you know, we were we were renting a school. Uh, we didn't have a mortgage with the church. We had a very low overhead with the church. We were saving. Mm-hmm. Uh, every single month, because partly because my salary is probably too low, but we were mm-hmm. <laughs> we were saving, you know, easily ten grand uh, a month uh-huh. with the church. And so every time I saw people leave, mm-hmm. and I know this sounds vain, some of our listeners will be like, "What? I can't believe you think like that." I'm telling you, mm-hmm. your pastor thinks like this. 
I, I'm not saying it's it's the the predominant thought in his mind, but every time we saw people leave, I thought we can afford it. Now, I didn't want them to leave. As a pastor, as a uh-huh. shepherd, I wanted to leave the 99, go for the one, and I often did. I'd have conversations with them. I mean, I made it hard for people to leave, sometimes mm-hmm. too hard. There were some people I probably just should have <laughs> let go. But, but you know, I, I as a shepherd, I wanted to bring them back. I was like, I, I know you're offended, but I really don't think you should be. This is what God's word says. Can I answer your questions? Do you mm-hmm. have concerns? But, but, you know, some people just didn't stick around. And with the people that I couldn't, I couldn't save, not mm-hmm. meaning they're not a Christian, but I couldn't save as far as keep them in the church. For those individuals, uh, the one thing, it, it hurt relationally. It, it was um, it was sad. It was painful. But the one thing that I didn't have, in addition to all that hanging over my head, was will I be able to get a paycheck this month? Because mm-hmm. I knew financially we can afford to lose 40 mm-hmm. people, 50 people, mm-hmm. 60 people, because my salary was low. The overhead of the church overall was low. And even when I left the church, a lot of pastors, I, I knew I knew another pastor who I, I of course won't name, but um, mm-hmm. he resigned from ministry and he, you know, left, left his church and he left them with nothing. They, they had mm-hmm. like literally zero dollars in the bank. And, mm-hmm. uh, and by God's grace, I was able to, to move to Texas to plant a new church and still leave the church behind with about $600,000 in the bank. Mm. Uh, $600,000 it's dwindling because of all the inflation and the things you're talking about. So <laughs> they need to do something with maybe they take that 600,000 and put it in bitcoin. I don't know, but but the point is, you know, I like I was able to leave them with something and all I'm saying is theologically because some of our guests are what is this but what's the biblical principle? Having money in the bank as a church and not having a massive overhead and not having a mortgage um, it, there, there was a freedom for me as a pastor uh, when it came to uh, how courageous I could be. And you might just say, well, you should have had that freedom no matter what. Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. But at the same time, I, I also have to feed my, my, my wife and children. Uh, I have certain responsibilities. And you could say, well, maybe the real solution is for pastors just to be bivocational. Well, that opens up a whole nother can of worms in terms of like, there's a reason why the Bible talks about the worker deserving the wages that don't Mm -hmm. muzzle the ox while he treads the grain. And the Bible Mm -hmm. relates that to the pastor. A lot of pastors, there's nothing wrong with being bivocational. And that does Mm -hmm. give you a certain financial freedom to be courageous and bold and not give in to the fear of man and what your parishioners Mm -hmm. might think. But at the same time, the bivocational guy, uh, he doesn't have 40 hours a week to be reading Mm -hmm. the commentaries, to be diving Mm -hmm. as deep into the scripture. So I I know bivocational pastors, and um, they just simply cannot, there's just not enough time in the week for them to devote as much time pastoring and shepherding the flock and studying Mm -hmm. the word of God to publicly preach. But then I know guys who are vocational pastors, and they've got you know, a, a better shot at, at being well-learned and and, mm-hmm. and well-versed in the scripture and spending time counseling their parishioners. But there's this leverage as far as they need that paycheck. And so it's just uh-huh. like, there's always yeah. at, at some angle, it's like, it's easy to be owned, but it, you know, and, and to be a slave to either the fear of man or to be a slave to, to mammon, to, to, to mm-hmm. money. Um, but it sounds like one, at least practical strategy that you're kind of that you're kind of recommending to to get out from some of that slavery is for individuals not to be in debt and also for mm-hmm. churches not to be in debt. And, and you're kind of saying that maybe that even affects whether or not a, sh- a church should, uh, should have a building. It's one thing to own it outright and to actually mm-hmm. save up, you know, $4 mm-hmm. million or whatever it costs, but to, to have that mortgage, you're, it mm-hmm. sounds like you're saying that's maybe not the best thing to do. No, I, right? I I think it's unbiblical. I think it's, it, it ultimately ends up uh, corrupting the church. And and the thing is, like all of these things work together, right? Uh, those people that left your church, well, they went to the church next door that's like super nice and has a beautiful mm-hmm. building and has a mortgage. The thing is, like there mm-hmm. there's temptations for uh, the congregants to go go somewhere where. Um, you know, they'll be more, you know, satisfied because, you know, they're not being condemned for, uh, you know, sins uh, that they're practicing in their life. And, and instead, mm-hmm. they'll go to the pastor that'll tell them what they want to hear. I mean, to, to me, right. that's what prosperity preaching is all about, right? It's, right. it's worshiping, uh, you know, I'm worshiping money anyway. Uh, so can mm-hmm. you tell me, give me a justification for why God says that's okay. Um, you know, mm-hmm. that, that to me is what that is. And, and, you know, all, all of these things work together uh, um, and it, it is very, very difficult to find um, 
churches that are courageous and and we just saw this mm. with the, with the entire coronavirus stuff it, it, right it's, right you know they, they every single one of them seem to uh well not every single one there there's some notable exceptions and whatnot but, most, but they seem to just uh ju just comply with whatever government said they folded quickly yeah because in a sense they've built their identity on this niceness uh to to mm. to a degree and you know, they they also might be taking PPP loans or, you know, right. Like I was going to ask you, what, so what do you think? Because I know a lot of pastors and churches that mm -hmm. took the, the triple P loans. Our, so mm -hmm. that's another thing. Like our church did, you know, not only did I leave the church with mm -hmm. money in the bank, but but also we we on principle didn't even apply uh, for one of those loans, because even though it's forgivable, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm still under the impression that if you take the king's coin, you become the king's man. And I don't want to be the only king whose man I want to be is King Jesus, um, uh -huh. not not King yeah. Trump or King Biden. <laughs> so what, what did you think about churches taking the triple P loans? What, what do you think well, about that? So let me let me let me talk about the businesses that took the triple P loans and how that okay. All right. completely affects the economy, because because uh, I, I don't think this is very obvious to a lot of people. Yeah, it helps a lot of those businesses stay alive. Fine. That, that that much is true, and uh, to a large degree, the government caused the crisis, so they're uh, they're they're helping them out, and there there's some justice in that. But think about think about what happens with these businesses. Who are they serving now? It used to be that businesses serve the customer, right? Like the uh, they they were trying to fulfill the needs of the customer in some way, shape, or form with their mm -hmm. good or service. And that that's what a business should be there. It, it's right. to provide value to somebody else. To me, that's what it means to love your neighbor. It, it, it's to right. provide value to them in a fair exchange. And that that's totally fine. But you take the PPP loan, what happens? Well, now you are much more concerned with fulfilling the terms of the PPP loan, especially if it can be forgiven, in which case, mm. You don't care as much about your customers anymore. And in fact, I've mm. experienced this. I, I tried to book an appointment with a service that I like. And they were like, oh, you know what? We don't have enough workers because we want to make sure that this PPP loan lasts a long time. So we're only mm -hmm. hiring, like, we only have certain number of slots. And I'm like, this would never happen with a normal business. You wouldn't turn a customer right. away because, you know, you, you want to make sure that they're satisfied. Um, instead, they what they've done is they're, they're stretching it out. We want to make sure we fulfill the everything to the letter and that that's what they do um mm -hmm. now thinking about it in a church context that's what churches do too right like who right. are you serving right these businesses are serving the government uh whatever the terms of the ppp loan are instead of their customer for a church there's a there's a much bigger calling here who are you serving you right. should be serving god instead you are serving the terms of this loan and that mm -hmm. that's that those are that's a big you know, problem. I mean, you you can't serve both. You really can't. That's right. Somebody said that you can't serve two masters. Who was that? <laughs> uh, I the whole time you're talking, I kept thinking about Joseph. Um, I, I just finished reading uh, Genesis, you know, and and uh, and it, it's just interesting. I kept thinking about you know when Joseph became you know second in command, you know only second to to Pharaoh himself. God elevated him and gave him favor, and Pharaoh had this dream that. God, you know, enabled Joseph to interpret the seven years of plenty and then seven years followed by seven years of famine. Um, it's interesting because what happened is during the seven years of, of plenty, um, they had a tax on all of Egypt where they had to give the fifth to Pharaoh, 20 percent. Um, and, and you hear that and you're like, 20 percent, that's a lot. And then I, it's like, oh, wait, I live in America. I guess, it's <laughs> you know, somewhat, you know, but uh, it's funny. I mean, in, in Old Testament books, like with Israel, you know, they, they used to say that, you know, uh, if you have a king, like, for instance, like Samuel, you know, with the people, we want a king, we want a king. And Samuel, he's dejected. And, and you know, the Lord says, they have not rejected you as prophet, but they've rejected me as God. And, uh, but before you, you know, go and give them what they want. They're asking, be careful what you wish for. The Israel's asking for something wicked, but go ahead. I'm going to give them what they want. I'm going to use you, Samuel, to anoint a king. Um, but before you do, I want you to tell them what they're getting themselves into. And, and so then Samuel gives them the warning of like, if you have a king, this is what it's going to look like that, you know, your, your sons are going to be, you know, drafted into his militia and your daughter is going to be used in this way. And you're going to have to pay taxes here and this and that. And one of the things is that if you have a king, he might be such a tyrant one day down the line that you might have to pay almost 10% in taxes. That's what, <laughs> the, the, that's what the Bible says. 
a tenth, a whole tenth of what you have. Mm -hmm. And and you look at that, and that's, I mean, this is literally the word of God saying to Israel, mm -hmm. like, if you get a king, it might be so oppressive, so tyrannical, so horrible that you might have 10% in taxes. And then you think of where we're at as a nation. So my point is, in, in the midst of, of, of Pharaoh knowing, because the God of heaven gave him a supernatural dream and empowered Joseph to interpret it, knowing that there would be seven years of basically no crops, no harvest, no resources, no food. And then seven years before that of, of plenty, under that dire of a situation, they only took 20%. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a very supernatural thing. But the whole point that I'm trying to make is this seven years of taking a fifth from all the Egyptians to Pharaoh. And then it was it was after earning, right, creating, storing up. They, they actually had the grain in silos. Mm -hmm. They actually had the resources. It wasn't just Pharaoh printing money. It was like, no, mm -hmm. I, I actually have all this grain. And then what happened was when the seven years of famine hit, uh, each year the people would come to get allotments. And they and they had mm -hmm. from giving their their 20, you know, their 20% to Pharaoh from seven years of plenty, they, they could give, you know, hand in these, I don't know what it was, if it was a printed receipt or whatever it was, but they could go and they could say, hey, this is the taxes that I paid. And they would get mm -hmm. a return and they'd get a return and they'd get a return. Now, uh, finally, they, they ran out of that. They ran out of their money that they could buy grain with. And so then they eventually had to sell uh, the land and themselves. So they sold the livestock first, and then they eventually had to sell the land. And so by the end of that, that seven years of plenty and then the seven years of famine, Pharaoh owned everything. He owned mm -hmm. the land of everyone except for his priest because they had like an allotment from Pharaoh. Uh, but all the people of Egypt, they were, they were a completely owned nation. Mm -hmm. They, they, it's it's ironic, but Egypt, and this is before Egypt enslaved Israel. Uh, mm -hmm. But Egypt, prior to being uh, to to being captors enslaving Israel, they were enslaved themselves. Uh, they had to sell not just not just use their money, but eventually they had to sell themselves and their land. They no longer had any property; it all belonged to Pharaoh in in some way, some shape, or form or another. And and I feel like that's. It sounds like from what you're saying that in many ways, that's kind of where we're at, except except Pharaoh at least earned it in the sense that <laughs> Pharaoh actually took a 20% tax from people, actually uh -huh. had the grain. And it sounds like we're we're in the in the process, maybe we're already there, but we're on our way to being owned by our government, by our civil magistrate, except they didn't even store things up in order, mm -hmm. and then we bought it back from them to enslave ourselves. They just had a magical machine and just printed grain or the illusion of grain and, and started buying up all the people, whether it be a, I, I feel like there are people in the government who are probably just, just in glee, you know, I mean, just mm -hmm. so happy with, with COVID because triple P loans and we own this business. Mm -hmm. We own this church. We own mm -hmm. this, we own that. We like, and, but, but it didn't cost them anything. They didn't have to open a silo and let out real tangible grain. They they just mm -hmm. came up with this PPP loan, and mm -hmm. and it's just I, I I'm just saying all that to say, I mean that was a dire circumstance with Joseph, and it mm -hmm. still sounds better than the situation we're in because at least it was the seven years of plenty first, <laughs> yeah, and there was actually grain stored up, and there was actually you know it was real. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it, it is scary to think like the things that you're saying to think like where we're headed, and it sounds like you think that Bitcoin may be the solution. So I so what? Let me let me kind of wrap up the episode with this. What can Christians do then? What should Christians do to get out of slavery, to get out of debt, mm -hmm. but but also knowing that we still live in in a nation that that's the way we do money in America isn't isn't really great. So. So how can Christians get out of debt, which is good and biblical and right, but then not be penalized by their savings constantly being depleted through inflation? And what should how should Christians what should Christians do right now to be to build wealth and to be financially wise? Yeah, and this is this is the value proposition of Bitcoin is that it is essentially a savings technology. This is what money should be. It it, it allows you to store value instead of having it sort of taken away from you by the central mm -hmm. bank money printers. And uh and you can opt out of the system by buying some Bitcoin. And if you use that as your savings, it will last because it is perfectly scarce. There's 21 million. Mm -hmm. 
So whatever portion you buy will still be the same portion. Uh, um, the denominator on the US dollar constantly changes. It grew like 30% last year alone. So uh, mm. that, that tells you that your savings are being diluted if you keep it in dollars. This is why people put it in real estate or stock because it stores value right. better. But those, those have been essentially hyperinflating over the last year because mm -hmm. of all of the money printing that's going on. Instead, mm. you can opt out of the system and, uh, and go with Bitcoin. And this is what a lot of people are doing. A lot of companies are doing it. A lot of, mm. uh, you know, um, insurance companies are doing it. Endowments are doing it. They're, um, and and they're, they're all doing it because they see the same thing that a lot of Bitcoiners do. Uh, and hopefully you do, which is that the rest of the system is just printing money like crazy. And as a result of that, like every, everything, uh, there's no safe place to put money, really. Um, mm -hmm. Bitcoin is one of the few places where, you know, I mean, uh, admittedly, it's fairly young, but uh, it's it's 12 years old. But fiat money as it exists today only started in 1971. So it's only 50 years old. And every mm -hmm. uh, the average lifespan of a fiat currency, according to a study of like 800 different fiat currencies, is 23 years. So mm. in a sense, it's uh, like it never really works out when you have somebody in the middle all the time. But with Bitcoin, mm. this, this is hard money. This is uh, perfectly scarce. And in, in a way, it gives us a way out of the current system. You can save in it um, and, and do something with it. And, uh, and you know, by God's grace, because uh, of how it's appreciated, a lot of people have been able to pursue what God's calling is uh, for them instead mm. of, uh, you know, working a job that you don't like be to pay off debts on that you spent on stuff that you didn't even really want, right? Like that, that's mm -hmm. the unfortunate situation a lot of people find themselves in. Uh, so, yeah. you know, uh, we, we see, uh, at least uh, me and my co-authors that wrote the book, we see this as the redemption of money. It's, it's something that brings us closer to that principle of sowing and reaping that you uh, you laid out earlier. You get to sow and reap instead of having it constantly eaten by uh, yeah. moth and dust and whatever. It's it's mm -hmm. it's something that stores value and uh, and, you know, that that that's closer to what God intended than the current monetary system, which is a cesspool of that. Yeah, I, I love it. And I, I think, you know, some of our listeners, I could just kind of hear in the back of my head, them playing the devil's advocate and maybe pushing back and saying, but Joel, doesn't Jesus say that, that, that the only place to store true riches that moth and rust never destroy, it just, it's not Bitcoin. It's not anything. It's not here on mm -hmm. earth. It's, it's in heaven. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, you know, if any listeners thinking that, I think what I would say, and I think what Jimmy would agree with is, um, absolutely. Heaven is the only surefire uh, place mm -hmm. where, where, where you're, you're not stolen from and you're not robbed and where your treasure endures forever and, and appreciates mm -hmm. at, um, mm -hmm. throughout eternity. Um, and yet, and yet part of what we want to do as image bearers of the living God. And part of what we want to do as, as Christians is not just merely fulfilling the great commission in terms of conversions and baptism and preaching the gospel and, and discipling, making disciples. But, but part of the great commission, we always forget this part is that we teach people to obey all of Christ's commands. And part of what the gospel does is first and foremost, it saves sinners by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But part of what good gospel work also does in teaching those sinners now redeemed to obey all of Christ's commands is, is that, the gospel and the kingdom of Christ, as it expands like a mustard seed, it starts small, but, but it begins to grow like a little bit of yeast working its way through the whole batch of dough. The kingdom of God, this gospel advancement and teaching people, discipling them and teaching them to obey all of Christ's commands, it pushes back the curse. That's mm. that Jesus, it's, it's not just that he's coming back one day to, re Jesus is redeeming the world now. He is ruling mm -hmm. and reigning currently seated at the right hand of his father. And one by one, his enemies are being made subject to him and being placed as a footstool underneath his feet. The world is getting better. Poverty is becoming more scarce where, and wealth mm. is something that is growing. And, and so uh, part of our duty as Christians is first and foremost to preach the gospel, to make disciples, to see people saved by the grace of God, to baptize them into the name of the, the, the triune God. But but in all of our life, in entertainment and in media and, and in and vocation and work and medicine and in money, 
we want to work to apply biblical principles and push back the curse. And we know that the curse will never be completely pushed back until Christ returns and 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 in the new heavens and the new earth, that's the place where moth and rust will never destroy even an ounce. But that doesn't mean that we can't improve things now. That doesn't mean that we can't build better barns now that, that are more protective and more wise and, and more just. It's not just about protecting our stuff, but it, it's more moral, it's more righteous, it's more just, and it is more pleasing to the Lord. And so mm -hmm. um, money is not the root of all evil. As we know, it's the love of money and someone who's mm -hmm. simply trying to be wise and protect wealth and protect the wealth of others. That doesn't mean that they're an idolater necessarily. That doesn't mean that they are sinning or greedy necessarily. It actually could be uh, that they're actually doing something righteous. Like when the Bible in the Old Testament talks about defending the defenseless, right? Mm -hmm. uh, protecting the poor from being oppressed by rulers and by the rich. And um, so I don't, I don't know everything that there is to know about Bitcoin. I feel like I learned a ton tonight. I feel like our listeners learned a ton tonight. But from what I can tell right now, it does sound like at least a possible strategy of, of God by his grace through not just people, but, but Christians like Jimmy pushing back the curse and redeeming uh, money. Jesus is redeeming not just people, but, but this world. This is God's world. He loves it. He's not just going to throw it away. He, when Christ returns, it's not to for the earth to just be wadded up and thrown away like trash. He is redeeming the cosmos, and even the creation itself is groaning with eager expectations to be restored. And, and that involves not just plants and trees, but all things, um, including currency. And so, Jimmy, I just want to say thank you so much for you coming on the show. And uh, real quick, we always do a bonus question for our, our club members. So let me okay. whet um, uh, are the appetite. If you're not a responder, that's what we call our club members. I encourage you guys to, to become a responder, sign up, support this ministry, pray for us, and you'll get to listen to the bonus question. Here's the bonus question. Jimmy, do you think that Bitcoin will significantly increase in its value in terms of, of its relation to the U.S. dollar in the near future? Um, or do you feel like it might already be a little bit inflated? Aside from the moral motivations that we've already discussed, do you think that Bitcoin is a wise investment in the in the near future over this next year um, in today's economic climate with the changes in politics and all that kind of stuff? So that's that's our question. Uh, real quick, let's go ahead and end the episode. And Jimmy will come back on for a, a few minutes and answer that. But real quick, could you tell our listeners how they can keep up with you and how they can follow you and see what God's doing in your life? Uh, well, I'm uh, available on Twitter at Jimmy Song. I have a website, programmingbitcoin.com. Uh, it has links to all my books. Uh, I also do a podcast, Bitcoin Fixes This, which you can find on iTunes and uh, wherever you find podcasts. Uh, and uh, yeah, you, you can, all of, all of those channels, uh, plus my newsletter, jimmysong.substack.com. That's a technical newsletter. So probably okay. uh, not necessarily uh, <laughs> yeah. as interesting. Maybe for some for, of our listeners. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, not technical, but if you're technical, yeah, it, that, that's where you can find me. Cool. Great. And then one last time, I just want to go ahead and plug his book one more time. We got Thank God for Bitcoin, uh, The Creation, Corruption, and Redemption of Money. He co-authored this with a bunch of authors. And I remember when we got lunch asking you, like, what was that like to write a book with eight people? But it sounds like it was a blast. Uh, I encourage you guys to uh, get a copy. Where can they get this, Jimmy? Uh, they can get it on Amazon. Um, okay. uh, we're working on the audio book, uh, but you know you can get a paper copy or on the Kindle, hopefully hardcover pretty soon. Cool. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, uh, we hope that you'll take a moment and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can watch more content like this. Also, take a moment and give this video a like so that it can reach more people. And take a moment and click on the bell so that you'll be notified whenever we come out with new content. Thanks so much. God bless.